The Spiritual Problem of Modern Man by Carl Jung The spiritual problem of modern man is one of those questions which belong so intimately to the present in which we are living that we cannot judge of them fully. The modern man is a newly formed human being, a modern problem is a question which has just arisen and whose answer lies in the future. In speaking, therefore, of the spiritual problem of modern man we can at most state a question, and we should perhaps put this statement in different terms if we had but the faintest inkling of the answer. The question, moreover, seems rather vague, but the truth is that it has to do with something so universal that it exceeds the grasp of any single human being. We have reason enough, therefore, to approach such a problem with true moderation and with the greatest caution. I am deeply convinced of this, and wish it stressed the more because it is just such problems which tempt us to use high-sounding words, and because I shall myself be forced to say certain things which may sound immoderate and incautious to begin at once with an example of such apparent lack of caution, I must say that the man we call modern, the man who is aware of the immediate present, is by no means the average man. He is rather the man who stands upon a peak, or at the very edge of the world, the abyss of the future before him, above him the heavens, and below him the whole of mankind with a history that disappears in primeval mists. The modern man, or, let us say again, the man of the immediate present, is rarely met with. There are few who have up to the name, for they must be conscious to a superlative degree since to be wholly of the present means to be fully conscious of one's existence as a man, it requires the most intensive and extensive consciousness, with a minimum of unconsciousness. It must be clearly understood that the mere fact of living in the present does not make a man modern, for in that case everyone at present alive would be so. He alone is modern, who is fully conscious of the present. The man whom we can with justice call modern is solitary. He is so of necessity and at all times, for every step towards a fuller consciousness of the present removes him further from his original participation mystique with the mass of men, from submersion m a common unconsciousness every step forward means an act of tearing himself loose from that all-embracing, pristine unconsciousness which claims the bulk of mankind almost entirely. Even in our civilizations the people who form, psychologically speaking, the lowest stratum, live almost as unconsciously as primitive races those of the succeeding stratum manifest a level of consciousness which corresponds to the beginnings of human culture, while those of the highest stratum have a consciousness capable of keeping step with the life of the last few centuries. Only the man who is modern in our meaning of the term really lives in the present, he alone has a present-day consciousness, and he alone finds that the ways of life which correspond to Earlier levels pall upon him the values and strivings of those past worlds no longer interest him save from the historical standpoint. Thus he has become unhistorical in the deepest sense and has estranged himself from the mass of men who live entirely within the bounds of tradition. Indeed, he is completely modern only when he has come to the very edge of the world, leaving behind him all that has been discarded and outgrown, and acknowledging that he stands before a void out of which all things may grow. These words may be thought to be but empty sound, and their meaning reduced to mere banality nothing is easier than to affect a consciousness of the present. As a matter of fact, a great horde of worthless people give themselves the air of being modern by overleaping the various stages of development and the tasks of th they represent. They appear suddenly by the side of the truly modern man as uprooted human beings, blood-sucking ghosts, whose emptiness is taken for the inenviable loneliness of the modern man and casts discredit upon him he and his kind, few in number as they are, are hidden from the undiscerning eyes of mass men by those clouds of ghosts, the pseudo-moderns. It cannot be helped, the modern man is questionable and suspect, and has always been so, even in the past. An honest profession of modernity means voluntarily declaring bankruptcy, taking the vows of poverty and chastity in a new sense, and, what is still more painful, renouncing the halo which history bestows as a mark of its sanction. To be unhistorical is the Promethean SM, and in this sense modern man lives in sin. A higher level of consciousness is like a burden of guilt. But, as I have said, only the man who has outgrown the stages of consciousness belonging to the past and has amply fulfilled the duties appointed for him by his world, can achieve a full consciousness of the present. To do this he must be sound and proficient in the best sense, a man who has achieved as much as other people, and even a little more. It is these qualities which enable him to gain the next highest level of consciousness. I know that the idea of proficiency is especially repugnant to the pseudo-moderns, for it reminds them unpleasantly of their deceits. 
This, however, cannot prevent us from taking it as our criterion of the modern man. We are even forced to do so, for unless he is proficient, the man who claims to be modern is nothing but an unscrupulous gambler. He must be proficient in the highest degree, for unless he can atone by creative ability for his break with tradition, he is merely disloyal to the past. It is sheer juggling to look upon a denial of the past as the same thing as consciousness of the present. Today stands between yesterday and tomorrow and forms a link between past and future, it has no other meaning. The present represents a process of transition, and that man may account himself modern who is conscious of it in this sense. Many people call themselves modern, especially pseudo-moderns. Therefore the real modern man is often to be found among those who call themselves old-fashioned. He takes this stand for sufficient reasons. On the one hand he emphasizes the past in order to hold the scales against his break with tradition and that effective guilt of which I have spoken. On. The other hand he wishes to avoid being taken for a pseudo-modern. Every good quality has its bad side, and nothing that is good can come into the world without directly producing a corresponding evil. This is a painful fact. Now there is the danger that consciousness of the present may lead to an elation based upon illusion, the illusion, namely, that we are the culmination of the history of mankind, the fulfillment and the end product of countless centuries. If we grant this, we should understand that it is no more than the proud acknowledgement of our destitution, we are also the disappointment of the hopes and expectations of the ages. Think of nearly 2,000 years of Christian ideals followed, instead of by the return of the Messiah and the heavenly millennium, by the world war among Christian nations and its barbed wire and poison gas. What a catastrophe in heaven and on earth. In the face of such a picture we may well grow humble again. It is true that modern man is a culmination, but tomorrow he will be surpassed. He is indeed the end product of an age-old development, but he is at the same time the worst conceivable disappointment of the hopes of humankind. The modern man is aware of this. He has seen how beneficent are science, technology and organization, but also how catastrophic they can be. He has likewise seen that well-meaning governments have so thoroughly paved the way for peace on the principle in time of peace prepare for war that Europe has nearly gone to rack and ruin. And as for ideals, the Christian Church, the Brotherhood of Man, international social democracy and the solidarity of economic interests have all failed to stand the baptism of fire, the test of reality. Today, 15 years after the war, we observe once more the same optimism, the same organization, the same political aspirations, the same phrases and catchwords at work. How can we but fear that they will inevitably lead to further catastrophes? Agreements to outlaw war leave us skeptical, even while we wish them all possible success. At bottom, behind every such palliative measure, there is a gnawing doubt. On the whole, I believe I am not exaggerating when I say that modern man has suffered an almost fatal shock, psychologically speaking, and as a result has fallen into profound uncertainty. These statements, I believe, make it clear enough that my being a physician has colored my views. A doctor always spies out diseases, and I cannot cease to be a doctor but it is essential to the physician's art that he should not discover diseases where none exist so will therefore not make the assertion that the white races in general, and occidental nations in particular, are diseased, or that the western world is on the verge of collapse. I am in no way competent to pass such a judgment. It is of course only from my own experience with other persons and with myself that I draw my knowledge of the spiritual problem of modern men I know something of the intimate psychic life of many hundreds of educated persons, both sick and healthy, coming from every quarter of the civilized, white world, and upon this experience I base my statements no doubt I can draw only a one-sided picture. For the things I have observed are events of psychic life, the he within us, on the inner side. If I may use the expression. I must point out that this is not always true of psychic life, the psyche is not always and everywhere to be found on the inner side. It is to be found on the outside in whole races or periods of history which take no account of psychic life as such. As examples we may choose any of the ancient cultures, but especially that of Egypt with its imposing objectivity and its naive confession of sins that have not been committed. We can no more feel the pyramids and the apis tombs of Saqqara to be expressions of personal problems or personal emotions than we can feel this of the music of Bach. 
Whenever there is established an external form, be it ritual or spiritual, by which all the yearnings and hopes of the soul are adequately expressed, as for instance in some living religion, then we may say that the psyche is outside, and no spiritual problem, strictly speaking, exists in consonance with this truth, the development of psychology falls entirely within the last decades. Although long before that man was introspective and intelligent enough to recognize the facts that are the subject matter of psychology. The same was the case with technical knowledge the Romans were familiar with all the mechanical principles and physical facts on the basis of which they could have constructed the steam engine, but all that came of it was the toy made by Hero of Alexandria there was no urgent necessity to go further. It was the division of labor and specialization in the 19th century which gave rise to the need to apply all available knowledge so also a spiritual need has produced in our time our discovery of psychology there has never, of course, been a time when the psyche did not manifest itself, but formerly it attracted no attention. No one noticed it people got along without heeding it, but today we can no longer get along unless we give our best attention to the ways of the psyche. It was men of the medical profession who were the first to notice this, for the priest is concerned only to establish an undisturbed functioning of the psyche within a recognized system of belief as long as this system gives true expression to life, psychology can be nothing but a technical adjuvant to healthy living, and the psyche cannot be regarded as a problem in itself while man still lives as a herd being he has no things of the spirit of his own, nor does he need any, save the usual belief in the immortality of the soul. But as soon as he has outgrown whatever local form of religion he was BOM to, as soon as this religion can no longer embrace his life and all its fullness, then the psyche becomes something in its own right which cannot be dealt with by the measures of the church alone it is for this reason that we of today have a psychology founded on experience, and not upon articles of faith or the postulates of any philosophical system. The very fact that we have such a psychology is to me symptomatic of a profound convulsion of spiritual life. Disruption in the spiritual life of an age shows the same pattern as radical change in an individual. As long as all goes well and psychic energy finds its application in adequate and well-regulated ways, we are disturbed by nothing from within no uncertainty or doubt besets us, and we cannot be divided against ourselves but no sooner are one or two of the channels of psychic activity blocked than we are reminded of a stream that is dammed up. The current flows backward to its source, the inner man wants something which the visible man does not want, and we are at war with ourselves only then, in this distress, do we discover the psyche, or, more precisely, we come upon something which thwarts our will, which is strange and even hostile to us, or which is incompatible with our conscious standpoint. Freud's psychoanalytic labors show this process is the clearest way. The very first thing he discovered was the existence of sexually perverse and criminal fantasies which at their face value are wholly incompatible with the conscious outlook of a civilized man. A person who was activated by them would be nothing less than a mutineer, a criminal or a madman. We cannot suppose that this aspect of the unconscious or of the hinterland of man's mind is something totally new probably it has always been there, in every culture each culture gave birth to its destructive opposite, but no culture or civilization before our own was ever forced to take these psychic undercurrents in deadly earnest. Psychic life always found expression in a metaphysical system of some sort but the conscious, modern man, despite his strenuous and dogged efforts to do so, can no longer refrain from acknowledging the might of psychic forces. This distinguishes our time from all others we can no longer deny that the dark stirrings of the unconscious are effective powers, that psychic forces exist which cannot, for the present at least, be fitted in with our rational world order we have even enlarged our study of these forces to a science, one more proof of the earnest attention we bring to them previous centuries could throw them aside unnoticed. For us they are assured of nessus which we cannot strip off. The revolution in our conscious outlook, brought about by the catastrophic results of the world war, shows itself in our inner life by the shattering of our faith in ourselves and our own worth. We used to regard foreigners, the other side, as political and moral reprobates, but the modern man is forced to recognize that he is politically and morally just like anyone else. Whereas I formerly believed it to be my bounden duty to call other persons to order, I now admit that I need calling to order myself. I admit this more readily because I realize only too well that I am losing my faith in the possibility of a rational organization of the world, that old dream of the millennium, in which peace and harmony should rule, has grown pale. 
The modern man's skepticism regarding all such matters has chilled his enthusiasm for politics and world reform, more than that, it does not favor any smooth application of psychic energies to the outer world through his skepticism the modern man is thrown back upon himself, his energies flow towards their source and wash to the surface those psychic contents which are at all times there, but he hidden in the silt as long as the stream flows smoothly in its course. How totally different did the world appear to medieval man? For him the earth was eternally fixed and at rest at the center of the universe, encircled by the course of a sun that solicitously bestowed its warmth. Men were all children of God under the loving care of the Most High, who prepared them for eternal blessedness, and all knew exactly what they should do and how they should conduct themselves in order to rise from a corruptible world to an incorruptible and joyous existence. Such a life no longer seems real to us, even in our dreams. Natural science has long ago torn this lovely veil to shreds. That age lies as far behind as childhood, when one's own father was unquestionably the handsomest and strongest man on earth. The modern man has lost all the metaphysical certainties of his medieval brother, and set up in their place the ideals of material security, general welfare and humaneness, but it takes more than an ordinary dose of optimism to make it appear that these ideals are still unshaken material security, even, has gone by the board. For the modern man begins to see that every step in material progress adds just so much force to the threat of a more stupendous catastrophe. The very picture terrorizes the imagination. What are we to imagine when cities today perfect measures of defense against poison gas attacks and practice them in dress rehearsals? We cannot but suppose that such attacks have been planned and provided for, again on the principle in time of peace prepare for war, let man but accumulate his materials of destruction and the devil within him will soon be unable to resist putting them to then, faded use. It is well known that firearms go off by themselves if only enough of them are together. An intimation of the law that governs blind contingency, which Heraclitus called the rule of enantiodromia, conversion into the opposite, now steals upon the modern man through the byways of his mind, chilling him with fear and paralyzing his faith and the lasting effectiveness of social and political measures in the face of these monstrous forces. If he turns away from the terrifying prospect of a blind world in which building and destroying successively tip the scale, and if he then turns his gaze inward upon the recesses of his own mind, he will discover a chaos and a darkness there which he would gladly ignore. Science has destroyed even the refuge of the inner life. What was once a sheltering haven has become a place of terror. And yet it is almost a relief for us to come upon so much evil in the depths of our own minds we are able to believe, at least, that we have discovered the root of the evil in mankind even though we are shocked and disillusioned at first, we yet feel, because these things are manifestations of our own minds, that we hold them more or less in our own hands and can therefore correct or at least effectively suppress them we like to assume that. If we succeeded in this, we should have rooted out some fraction of the evil in the world. We like to think that, on the basis of a widespread knowledge of the unconscious and its ways, no one could be deceived by a statesman who was unaware of his own bad motives, the very newspapers would pull him up please have yourself analyzed, you are suffering from a repressed father complex. I have purposely chosen this grotesque example to show to what absurdities we are led by the illusion that because something is psychic it is under our control it is, however, true that much of the evil in the world is due to the fact that man in general is hopelessly unconscious. As it is also true that with increasing insight we can combat this evil at its source in ourselves as science enables us to deal with injuries inflicted from without, so it helps us to treat those arising from within. The rapid and worldwide growth of a psychological interest over the last two decades shows unmistakably that modern man has to some extent turned his attention from material things to his own subjective processes. Should we call this mere curiosity? At any rate, art has a way of anticipating future changes M. Man's fundamental outlook and expressionist art has taken this subjective turn well in advance of the more general change. This psychological interest of the present time shows that man expects something from psychic life which he has not received from the outer world something which our religions, doubtless, ought to contain, but no longer do contain, at least for the modern man the various forms of religion no longer appear to the modern man to come from within, to be expressions of his own psychic life. For him they are to be classed with the things of the outer world. He has vouchsafed no revelation of a spirit that is not of this world, but he tries on a number of religions and convictions as if they were Sunday attire, only to lay them aside again like worn-out clothes. Yet he is somehow fascinated by the almost pathological manifestations of the unconscious mind. 
We must admit the fact, however difficult it is for us to understand. That something which previous ages have discarded should suddenly command our attention. That there is a general interest in these matters is a truth which cannot be denied, their offense to good taste notwithstanding. I am not thinking merely of the interest taken in psychology as a science, or of the still narrower interest in the psychoanalysis of Freud, but of the widespread interest in all sorts of psychic phenomena as manifested in the growth of spiritualism, astrology, theosophy, and so forth. The world has seen nothing like it since the end of the 17th century. We can compare it only to the flowering of Gnostic thought in the first and second centuries after Christ. The spiritual currents of the present have, in fact, a deep affinity with Gnosticism. There is even a Gnostic church in France today, and I know of two schools in Germany which openly declare themselves Gnostic. The modern movement which is numerically most impressive is undoubtedly Theosophy, together with its continental sister, Anthroposophy, these are pure Gnosticism in a Hindu dress. Compared with these movements the interest in scientific psychology is negligible. What is striking about Gnostic systems is that they are based exclusively upon the manifestations of the unconscious, and that their moral teachings do not balk at the shadow side of life. Even in the form of its European revival, the Hindu Kundalini Yoga shows this clearly. And as every person informed on the subject of occultism will testify, the statement holds true in this field as well. The passionate interest in these movements arises undoubtedly from psychic energy which can no longer be invested in obsolete forms of religion. For this reason such movements have a truly religious character, even when they pretend to be scientific it changes nothing when Rudolf Steiner calls his anthroposophy spiritual science, or Mrs. Eddy discovers a Christian science these attempts at concealment merely show that religion has grown suspect, almost as suspect as politics and world reform. I do not believe that I am going too far when I say that modern man, in contrast to his 19th century brother, turns his attention to the psyche with very great expectations, and that he does so without reference to any traditional creed, but rather in the Gnostic sense of religious experience we should be wrong am seeing mere caricature or masquerade when the movements already mentioned try to give themselves scientific airs. Their doing so is rather an indication that they are actually Pursuing science or knowledge instead of the faith, which is the essence of Western religions. The modern man abhors dogmatic postulates taken on faith and the religions based upon them he holds them valid only in so far as their knowledge content seems to accord with his own experience of the depths of psychic life he wants to know, to experience for himself Dean Inga of St. Paul's has called attention to a movement in the Anglican Church with similar objectives. The age of discovery has only just come to a close in our day when no part of the earth remains unexplored, it began when men would no longer believe that the Hyperboreans inhabited the land of eternal sunshine, but wanted to find out and to see with their own eyes what existed beyond the boundaries of the known world. Our age is apparently bent on discovering what exists in the psyche outside of consciousness. The question asked in every spiritualistic circle is, what happens when the medium has lost consciousness? Every theosophist asks, what shall I experience at higher levels of consciousness? The question which every astrologer puts is this, what are the effective forces and determinants of my fate beyond the reach of my conscious intention? And every psychoanalyst wants to know, what are the unconscious drives behind the neurosis? Our age wishes to have actual experiences in psychic life. It wants to experience for itself, and not to make assumptions based on the experience of other ages. Yet this does not preclude its trying anything in a hypothetical way, for instance, the recognized religions and the genuine sciences. The European of yesterday will feel a slight shudder run down his spine when he gazes at all deeply into these delvings not only does he consider the subject of this research all too obscure and uncanny, but even the methods employed seem to him a shocking misuse of man's finest intellectual attainments. What can we expect an astronomer to say when he is told that at least a thousand horoscopes are drawn today to one three hundred years ago? What will the educator and the advocate of philosophical enlightenment say to the fact that the world has not been freed of one single superstition since Greek antiquity? Freud himself, the founder of psychoanalysis, has thrown a glaring light upon the dirt, darkness and evil of the psychic hinterland, and has presented these things as so much refuse and slag, he has thus taken the utmost pains to discourage people from seeking anything behind them. He did not succeed, and his warning has even brought about the very thing he wished to prevent it has awakened in many people an admiration for all this filth. 
We are tempted to call this sheer perversity, and we could hardly explain it save on the ground that it is not a love of dirt, but the fascination of the psyche, which draws these people. There can be no doubt that from the beginning of the 19th century, from the memorable years of the French Revolution onwards, man has given a more and more prominent place to the psyche, his increasing attentiveness to it being the measure of its growing attraction for him. The enthronement of the goddess of reason in Notre Dame seems to have been a symbolic gesture of great significance to the Western world, rather like the hewing down of Votan's oak by the Christian missionaries for then, as at the revolution, no avenging bolt from heaven struck the blasphemer down. It is certainly more than an amusing coincidence that just at that time a Frenchman, Anquille du Perron, was living in India, and, in the early 1800s, brought back with him a translation of the Upnekat, a collection of fifty Upamshads, which gave the Western world its first deep insight into the baffling mind of the East to the historian this is mere chance without any factors of cause and effect but in view of my medical experience I cannot take it as accident. It seems to me rather to satisfy a psychological law whose validity in personal life, at least, is complete. For every piece of conscious life that loses its importance and value, so runs the law, there arises a compensation in the unconscious. We may see in this an analogy to the conservation of energy in the physical world. For our psychic processes have a quantitative aspect also. No psychic value can disappear without being replaced by another of equivalent intensity. This is a rule which finds its pragmatic sanction in the daily practice of the psychotherapist, it is repeatedly verified and never fails. Now the doctor in me refuses point-blank to consider the life of a people as something that does not conform to psychological law. A people, in the doctor's eyes, presents only a somewhat more complex picture of psychic life than the individual. Moreover, taking it the other way round, has not a poet spoken of the nations of his soul? And quite correctly, as it seems to me, for in one of its aspects the psyche is not individual, but is derived from the nation, from collectivity, or from humanity even. In some way or other we are part of an all-embracing psychic life, of a single greatest man, to quote Swedenborg. And so we can draw a parallel just as M. Me, a single human being, the darkness calls forth the helpful light, so does it also in the psychic life of a people in the crowds that poured into Notre Dame, bent on destruction, dark and nameless forces were at work that swept the individual off his feet, these forces worked also upon Anquidil du Perron, and provoked an answer which has come down in history. For he brought the Eastern mind to the West, and its influence upon us we cannot as yet measure. Let us beware of underestimating it. So far, indeed, there is little of it to be seen in Europe on the intellectual surface some Orientalists, one or two Buddhist enthusiasts, and a few somber celebrities like Madame Blavatsky and Annie Besant these manifestations make us think of tiny, scattered islands in the ocean of mankind. In reality they are like the peaks of submarine mountain ranges of considerable size the Philistine believed until recently that astrology had been disposed of long since and was something that could be safely laughed at. But today, rising out of the social deeps, it knocks at the doors of the universities from which it was banished some 300 years ago. The same is true of the thought of the East, it takes root in the lower social levels and slowly grows to the surface. Where did the five or six million Swiss francs for the Anthroposophist temple at Domac come from? Certainly not from one individual. Unfortunately, there are no statistics to tell us the exact number of avowed theosophists today, not to mention the unavowed, but we can be sure that there are several millions of them to this number we must add a few million spiritualists of Christian or theosophic leanings great innovations never come from above, they come invariably from below, just as trees never grow from the sky downward, but upward from the earth. However true it is that their seeds have fallen from above the upheaval of our world and the upheaval M consciousness is one and the same. Everything becomes relative and therefore doubtful. And while man, hesitant and questioning, contemplates a world that is distracted with treaties of peace and pacts of friendship, democracy and dictatorship, capitalism and Bolshevism, his spirit yearns for an answer that will allay the turmoil of doubt and uncertainty. And it is just people of the lower social levels who follow the unconscious forces of the psyche, it is the much derided, silent folk of the land, those who are less infected with academic prejudices than great celebrities are wont to be. All these people, looked at from above, present mostly a dreary or laughable comedy, and yet they are as impressively simple as those Galileans who were once called blessed. 
Is it not touching to see the refuse of man's psyche gathered together in compendia a foot thick? We find recorded in Anthropophytia with scrupulous care the merest babblings, the most absurd actions and the wildest fantasies, while men like Havelock Ellis and Freud have dealt with the like matters m serious treatises which have been accorded all scientific honors their reading public is scattered over the breadth of the civilized, white world. How are we to explain this seal, this almost fanatical worship of repellent things? In this way the repellent things belong to the psyche, they are of the substance of the psyche and therefore as precious as fragments of manuscript salvaged from ancient ruins even the secret and noisome things of the inner life are valuable to modern man because they serve his purpose. But what purpose? Freud has prefixed to his interpretation of dreams the citation, Flectra es iniquio super os Acheron to move bow, if I cannot bend the gods on high, I will at least set Acheron in uproar. But to what purpose? The gods whom we are called to dethrone are the idolized values of our conscious world it is well known that it was the love scandals of the ancient deities which contributed most to their discredit, and now history is repeating itself people are laying bare the dubious foundations of our belotted virtues and incomparable ideals, and are calling out to us in triumph, there are your man-made gods, mere snares and delusions tainted with human baseness, whited sepulchres full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. We recognize a familiar strain, and the gospel words, which we never could make our own, now come to life again. I am deeply convinced that these are not vague analogies. There are too many persons to whom Freudian psychology is dearer than the gospels, and to whom the Russian terror means more than civic virtue. And yet all these people are our brothers, and in each of us there is at least one voice which seconds them, for in the end there is a psychic life which embraces us all. The unexpected result of this spiritual change is that an uglier face is put upon the world. It becomes so ugly that no one can love it any longer, we cannot even love ourselves, and in the end there is nothing in the outer world to draw us away from the reality of the life within. Here, no doubt, we have the true significance of this spiritual change. After all, what does theosophy, with its doctrines of karma and reincarnation, seek to teach except that this world of appearance is but a temporary health resort for the morally unperfect seven it depreciates the present-day world no less radically than does the modern outlook, but with the help of a different technique, it does not vilify our world, but grants it only a relative meaning in that it promises other and higher worlds the result is in either case the same. I grant that all these ideas are extremely unacademic, the truth being that they touch modern man on the side where he is least conscious. Is it again a mere coincidence that modern thought has had to come to terms with Einstein's relativity theory and with ideas about the structure of the atom which lead us away from determinism and visual representation? Even physics volatilizes our material world. It is no wonder, then, in my opinion, if the modern man falls back upon the reality of psychic life and expects from it that certainty which the world deems him. But spiritually the Western world is in a precarious situation, and the danger is greater the more we blind ourselves to the merciless truth with illusions about our beauty of soul. The Occidental bums incense to himself, and his own countenance is veiled from him in the smoke. But how do we strike men of another color? What do China and India think of us? What feelings do we arouse in the black man? And what is the opinion of all those whom we deprive of their lands and exterminate with rum and venereal disease? I have a red Indian friend who is the governor of a pueblo. When we were once speaking confidentially about the white man, he said to me, we don't understand the whites. They are always wanting something, always restless, always looking for something. What is it? We don't know. We can't understand them. They have such sharp noses, such thin, cruel lips, such lines in their faces. We think they are all crazy. My friend had recognized, without being able to name it, the Aryan bird of prey with his insatiable lust to lord it in every land, even those that concern him not at all. And he had also noted that megalomania of ours which leads us to suppose, among other things, that Christianity is the only truth, and the white Christ the only redeemer. After setting the whole East in turmoil with our science and technology, and exacting tribute from it, we send our missionaries even to China. 
The stamping out of polygamy by the African missions has given rise to prostitution on such a scale that in Uganda alone 20,000 pounds sterling is spent yearly on preventatives of venereal infection, not to speak of the moral consequences, which have been of the worst. And the good European pays his missionaries for these edifying achievements. No need to mention also the story of suffering in Polynesia and the blessings of the opium trade. That is how the European looks when he is extricated from the cloud of his own moral incense. No wonder that to unearth buried fragments of psychic life we have first to dram a miasmal swamp. Only a great idealist like Freud could devote a lifetime to the unclean work this is the beginning of our psychology. For us, acquaintance with the realities of psychic life could start only at this end, with all that repels us and that we do not wish to see. But if the psyche consisted for us only of evil and worthless things, no power in the world could induce a normal man to pretend to find it attractive. This is why people who see in theosophy nothing but regrettable intellectual superficiality, and in Freudian psychology nothing but sensationalism, prophesy an early and inglorious end for these movements. They overlook the fact that they derive their force from the fascination of psychic life. No doubt the passionate interest that is aroused by them may find other expressions, but it will certainly show itself in these forms until they are replaced by something better. Superstition and perversity are after all one and the same. They are transitional or embryonic stages from which new and riper forms will emerge. Whether from the intellectual, the moral or the aesthetic viewpoint, the undercurrents of the psychic life of the West present an uninviting picture. We have built a monumental world around us, and have slaved for it with unequaled energy. But it is so imposing only because we have spent upon the outside all that is imposing in our natures, and what we find when we look within must necessarily be as it is, shabby and insufficient. I am aware that in saying this I somewhat anticipate the actual growth of consciousness. There is as yet no general insight into these facts of psychic life. Westerners are only on the way to a recognition of these facts, and for quite understandable reasons they struggle violently against it. Of course Spanglers. Pessimism has exerted some influence, but this has been safely confined to academic circles. As for psychological insight, it always trespasses upon personal life, and therefore meets with personal resistances and denials I am far from considering these resistances meaningless, on the contrary I see in them a healthy reaction to something which threatens destruction whenever relativism is taken as a fundamental and final principle it has a destructive effect when, therefore, I call attention to the dismal undercurrents of the psyche, it is not in order to sound a pessimistic note, I wish rather to emphasize the fact that the unconscious has a strong attraction not only for the sick, but for healthy, constructive minds as well, and this in spite of its alarming aspect. The psychic depths are nature, and nature is creative life. It is true that nature tears down what she has herself built up, yet she builds it once again. Whatever values in the visible world are destroyed by modern relativism, the psyche will produce their equivalents. At first we cannot see beyond the path that leads downward to dark and hateful things, but no light or beauty will ever come from the man who cannot bear the sight. Light is always born of darkness, and the sun never yet stood still in heaven to satisfy man's longing or to still his fears. Does not the example of Anquidil du Peron show us how psychic life survives its own eclipse? China hardly believes that European science and technology are preparing her ruin. Why should we believe that we must be destroyed by the secret, spiritual influence of the East? But I forget that we do not yet realize that while we are turning upside down the material world of the East with our technical proficiency, the East with its psychic proficiency is throwing our spiritual world into confusion we have never yet hit upon the thought that while we are overpowering the Orient from without, it may be fastening its hold upon us from within such an idea strikes us as almost insane. Because we have eyes only for gross material connections, and fail to see that we must lay the blame for the intellectual confusion of our middle class at the doors of Max Muller, Oldenburg, Newman, Dusen, Wilhelm and others like them what does the example of the Roman Empire teach us? After the conquest of Asia Minor, Rome became Asiatic, even Europe was infected by Asia, and remains so today out of Cilicia came the Mithraic cult, the religion of the Roman army, and it spread from Egypt to fog-bound Britain need I point to the Asiatic origin of Christianity? We have not yet clearly grasped the fact that Western theosophy is an amateurish imitation of the East. 
We are just taking up astrology again, and that to the Oriental is his daily bread. Our studies of sexual life, originating in Vienna and in England, are matched or surpassed by Hindu teachings on the subject. Oriental texts ten centuries old introduce us to philosophical relativism, while the idea of indetermination, newly broached in the West, furnishes the very basis of Chinese science. Richard Wilhelm has even shown me that certain complicated processes discovered by analytical psychology are recognizably described in ancient Chinese texts. Psychoanalysis itself and the lines of thought to which it gives rise, surely a distinctly Western development, are only a beginner's attempt compared to what is an immemorial art in the East. It should be mentioned that the parallels between psychoanalysis and yoga have already been traced by Oscar A. H. Schmitz. The theosophists have an amusing idea that certain Mahatmas, seated somewhere in the Himalayas or Tibet, inspire or direct every mind in the world. So strong, in fact, can be the influence of the Eastern belief in magic upon Europeans of a sound mind, that some of them have assured me that I am unwittingly inspired by the Mahatmas with every good thing I say, my own inspirations being of no account whatever this myth of the Mahatmas, widely circulated and firmly believed in the West, far from being nonsense, is, like every myth an important psychological truth. It seems to be quite true that the East is at the bottom of the spiritual change we are passing through today. Only this East is not a Tibetan monastery full of Mahatmas, but in a sense lies within us. It is from the depths of our own psychic life that new spiritual forms will arise, they will be expressions of psychic forces which may help to subdue the boundless lust for prey of Aryan man. We shall perhaps come to know something of that circumscription of life which has grown in the East into a dubious quietism, also something of that stability which human existence acquires when the claims of the spirit become as imperative as the necessities of social life. Yet in this age of Americanization we are still far from anything of the sort, and it seems to me that we are only at the threshold of a new spiritual epoch. I do not wish to pass myself off as a prophet, but I cannot outline the spiritual problem of modern man without giving emphasis to the yearning for rest that arises in a period of unrest, or to the longing for security that is bred of insecurity. It is from need and distress that new forms of life take their rise, and not from mere wishes or from the requirements of our ideals. To me, the crux of the spiritual problem of today is to be found in the fascination which psychic life exerts upon modern man. If we are pessimists, we shall call it a sign of decadence, if we are optimistically inclined, we shall see in it the promise of a far-reaching spiritual change in the Western world. At all events, it is a significant manifestation. It is the more noteworthy because it shows itself in broad sections of every people, and it is the more important because it is a matter of those imponderable psychic forces which transform human life in ways that are unforeseen and, as history shows, unforeseeable these are the forces, still invisible to many persons today, which are at the bottom of the present psychological interest. When the attractive power of psychic life is so strong that man is neither repelled nor dismayed by what he is sure to find, then it has nothing of sickness or perversion about it. Along the great high roads of the world everything seems desolate and outworn instinctively the modern man leaves the trodden ways to explore the bypaths and lanes, just as the man of the Greco-Roman world cast off his defunct Olympian gods and turned to the mystery cults of Asia. The force within us that impels us to the search, turning outward, annexes Eastern theosophy and magic, but it also turns inward and leads us to give our thoughtful attention to the unconscious psyche. It inspires in us the selfsame skepticism and relentlessness with which a Buddha swept aside his two million gods that he might come to the pristine experience which alone is convincing. And now we must ask a final question. Is what I have said of the modern man really true, or is it perhaps the result of an optical illusion? There can be no doubt whatever that the facts I have cited are wholly irrelevant contingencies in the eyes of many millions of Westerners and seem only regrettable errors to a large number of educated persons. But I may ask, what did a cultivated Roman think of Christianity when he saw it spreading among the people of the lowest classes? The biblical God is still a living person in the Western world, as living as Allah beyond the Mediterranean. One kind of believer holds the other an ignoble heretic, to be pitted and tolerated if he cannot be changed what is more, a clever European is convinced that religion and such things are good enough for the masses and for women, but are of little weight compared to economic and political affairs. 
so I am refuted all along the line, like a man who predicts a thunderstorm when there is not a cloud in the sky perhaps it is a storm beneath the horizon that he senses, and it may never reach us but what is significant in psychic life is always below the horizon of consciousness, and when we speak of the spiritual problem of modern man we are dealing with things that are barely visible, with the most intimate and fragile things, with flowers that open only in the night, in daylight. Everything is clear and tangible, but the night lasts as long as the day, and we live em the night time also. There are persons who have bad dreams which even spoil their days for them. And the day's life is for many people such a bad dream that they long for the night when the spirit awakes. I even believe that there are nowadays a great many such people, and this is why I maintain that the spiritual problem of modern man is much as I have presented it. I must plead guilty, indeed, to the charge of one-sidedness, for I have not mentioned the modern spirit of commitment to a practical world about which everyone has much to say because it lies in such full view we find it in the idea of internationalism or supranationalism which is embodied in the League of Nations and the like, and we find it also in sport and, very expressively, in the cinema and in jazz music. These are certainly characteristic symptoms of our time, they show unmistakably how the ideal of humanism is made to embrace the body also sport represents an exceptional valuation of the human body, as does also modern dancing the cinema, on the other hand, like the detective story, makes it possible to experience without danger all the excitement, passion and desirousness which must be repressed in a humanitarian ordering of life it is not difficult to see how these symptoms are connected with the psychic situation. The attractive power of the psyche brings about a new self-estimation, a re-estimation of the basic facts of human nature we can hardly be surprised if this leads to the rediscovery of the body after its long depreciation in the name of the spirit we are even tempted to speak of the body's revenge upon the spirit. When Kiesering sarcastically singles out the chauffeur as the culture hero of our time, he has struck, as he often does, close to the mark. The body lays claim to equal recognition, like the psyche, it also exerts a fascination if we are still caught by the old idea of an antithesis between mind and matter, the present state of affairs means an unbearable contradiction, it may even divide us against ourselves but if we can reconcile ourselves with the mysterious truth that spirit is the living body seen from within, and the body the outer manifestation of the living spirit, the two being really one, then we can understand why. It is that the attempt to transcend the present level of consciousness must give its due to the body. We shall also see that belief in the body cannot tolerate an outlook that denies the body in the name of the spirit. These claims of physical and psychic life are so pressing compared to similar claims in the past that we may be tempted to see in this a sign of decadence yet it may also signify a rejuvenation, for as Filderlin says, Danger itself Fosters the rescuing power what we actually see is that the Western world strikes up a still more rapid tempo, the American tempo, the very opposite of quietism and resigned aloofness. An enormous tension arises between the opposite poles of outer and inner life, between objective and subjective reality. Perhaps it is a final race between aging Europe and young America, perhaps it is a desperate or a wholesome effort of conscious man to cheat the laws of nature of their hidden might and to wrest a yet greater, more heroic victory from the sleep of the nations. This is a question which history will answer. In coming to a close after so many bold assertions, I would like to return to the promise made at the outset to be mindful of the need for moderation and caution indeed, I do not forget that my voice is but one voice, my experience a mere drop in the sea, my knowledge no greater than the visual field in a microscope, my mind's eye a mirror that reflects a small comer of the world, and my ideas, a subjective confession.